A day in the life of an ancient Egyptian slave. One of the most commonly held misconceptions about ancient Egypt is that slaves were used to build the pyramids. But recent archaeological evidence has found that this is not true, and it's now suggested it was either farmers who built the pyramids when flooding meant they could not work on their own lands, or that a workforce of laborers dedicated their entire lives to the task. That's not to say ancient Egypt didn't have slavery. It did. It was just a little different to how we imagine it today. Yeah. Welcome to A Day in History. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe below. Now, back to it. The ancient Egyptians did not have a word for slave. There is no direct translation, but there are references to people who were bound for life, known as squir anks suggesting that slavery in some form did exist in ancient Egypt, although it may not translate directly to today's understanding of slavery. Due to the absence of any evidence of a legal code outlining slavery in ancient Egypt, Egyptologists, such as Antonio Loprieno, have suggested that slavery could refer to socioeconomic dependency rather than a legal status. He argues that the virtual absence of legally codified slavery in a society so keen on written documentation cannot be accidental, yet also acknowledges the existence of coerced labor, prisoners of war, and restriction of individual freedoms for certain individuals throughout ancient Egypt. We also don't know if slavery meant for life. It's possible slaves or forced laborers were promised freedom or even actually were freed over time. But evidence for this is limited. If we take slavery, in the case of ancient Egypt, to mean unpaid labor or forced work, then three types of slavery were apparent in its history. Chattel slavery, bonded labor, and forced labor. Let's take a closer look at these. Number one, chattel slavery. Chattel slaves were either prisoners of war those guilty of illicit acts, or those born into the life from a slave mother. As far back as the reign of Sneferu in the Old Kingdom period of ancient Egypt, 2600 to 2200 BC, we have documented evidence of excursions to capture Libyan and Nubian civilians and force them into slavery as prisoners of war. These chattel slaves were seen as royal resources, controlled by the pharaoh who could either resettle them by moving them to labor colonies, give them to temples, or give them as rewards to individuals that might help earn political favor. This practice continued into the Middle Kingdom, where Asiatic slavery only increased in popularity. Although if not from Libya or Nubia, these individuals could have been released from bondage after a period of servitude. Number two, bonded labor. Self-sale into slavery was also something that happened in ancient Egypt. This usually occurred if someone found themselves in too much debt to shift, and, as a last act of desperation, they would sell themselves and their children into slavery in order to wipe their debt. This could happen to anyone at any level of ancient Egyptian society. But peasants would sometimes even just sell themselves for food or shelter. This was particularly common in the First Intermediate Period and Middle Kingdom era of ancient Egypt, 2181 to 1650 BC, where women were frequent victims of this type of slavery. Shabti Slaves Many ancient civilizations were fascinated with the concepts of gods and afterlife, and ancient Egyptians were no different, believing their time on Earth was just one part of their journey, and that in the afterlife, they would reclaim all that they had lost. There were some who were so desperate to guarantee their place in the afterlife that they willingly became a sort of bonded slave called Shabti. When we say sort of, it's because historians are unclear as to where Shabti came from and that some evidence suggests they had slightly more choice and freedom than a regular bonded slave. Women were almost certainly paid, whereas men were not. But to be a Shabti, was to be promised a place in the afterlife, which some historians argue would have been seen as payment enough. Number three, forced labor. This is where the ancient Egyptian government drafted workers from the general population and was called the corvée labor system, 
meaning unpaid or forced. This could be anything from military expeditions to get more chattel slaves, mining and quarrying or construction projects, anything the state deemed it required help on. This is also where the belief that slaves built the pyramids came from. Although, as we've already covered, this has since been disproved. Conscripted workers weren't slaves in the traditional sense that they were owned by someone, just that they weren't paid for their work as it was a duty to the state. Those who were promised payment, as it did occur in some cases, very rarely actually saw the pay materialize. In the Old Kingdom, it's believed that all serfs were subject to corvée labor and could be called upon by the state at any time, unless, of course, they were one of the protected upper classes, Egyptian royalty, nobility, and their dependents. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, historian Antonio Lorenzo describes forced slavery thusly, Servants are defined as men, but treated like property. The radicalization of coerced labor at the end of the Old Kingdom now seems to have reached its apex. In changing patterns of economic redistribution, poorer families would borrow grains from richer field owners and, short of paying back the borrowed amount, increasingly commit family members, especially women, to forced service in the owner's household. The definition royal laborer also emerged. These were state-owned slaves acquired through military campaign or trade and were seen as at the same position as the Asiatic slaves, who were also prominent in ancient Egypt and had a variety of household and other duties as field workers, gardeners, weavers, and servants. Life as a slave. Slaves were not separate from the general population in ancient Egypt. Historian Dr. Andrei Chviek explains they were assimilated in the local population and were not a separate social class. He claimed they were treated similarly to free folk and points to evidence of slaves marrying Egyptian women. There was also the traditional master-slave dichotomy and masters were able to use their slaves for domestic and labor services and could make them earn a trade or craft to become more valuable. The New Kingdom and Third Intermediate Period 1550 to 664 BC. By this period, historians have found evidence that slaves could become citizens of Egypt, own property, and had some legal protections. As a result, slaves from distant lands changed slightly in the New Kingdom and Third Intermediate Period. Rather than forced in prisoners of war, although these existed, more and more came as self-slaves, signing themselves up so they could enter Egypt in hope of a better life or to receive living quarters and food where otherwise they would have had none, or to honor the concept of Shabti and be granted admittance to work in the afterlife. Historians have found evidence that these slaves believed they could leave their masters if they had a justifiable reason for doing so, but actual instances where this happened haven't really been definitively proven. <laughs>